Hello, welcome to Jewish Museum Milwaukee. This is our Museum Moment program, and today we are joined by Samantha Abramson, the educate the the executive director of uh, the Holocaust Education Resource Center. I've got my education in front of my, it's all, it's all a jumble. Um, we are talking today, it's November 2nd, and a week from today is November 9th. November 9th is Kristallnacht. It's, uh, and today we felt like it was a great opportunity to explore Kristallnacht, which happened November 9th, 1938, explore the impact, how it shifted the course of Holocaust history, and then to talk about, um, kind of some of the very personal stories, but also how Hurt continues to commemorate this event. So, Samantha, um, do you wanna start by opening up, like what is Kristallnacht, what is its meaning, and, and how do you kind of use it in terms of Holocaust education? Absolutely, thanks Ellie. So Kristallnacht literally translates into the night of broken glass. And when we're talking about broken glass, that's in reference to the glass windows of, of Jewish shop owners, of, of homes owned, uh, owned by Jews, uh, because Kristallnacht at its, at its core was a program. It was a two-day program. In, uh, it started November 9th, went on the in, next day on November 10th. It was a program against Jews in Germany. And I should say it's not just Germany proper. By this point in 1938, we're also talking about Austria, which the Nazis are in control of, and the Sudan land, uh, which, which the Nazis have as well. So it's all three of those regions. And was there, you know, because it's like two days of mass violence, thousands of synagogues are burnt or destroyed. Um, people are started, are beaten. Windows, shops are, are, are um, the windows are busted. But was there some sort of kind of unifying rallying cry that led to this? So, of course, as you know, the there had been a lot of hate against against the Jews in, in Germany, which had started you know, for, for years. You know, there we had the Nuremberg laws. We had lots of discriminatory laws against Jews and, and Jews were excluded from, from very many parts of, of public life. Joseph Goebbels, who was the Minister of Enlightenment and Propaganda, a great title. Great. Um, <laughs> title. Um, you know, his job was to really inspire the masses uh, in Germany to really turn the public against enemies like, like the Jews. And there was an opportunity that presented itself on November 7th of 1938, so just a few days before Kristallnacht, uh, a Jewish teenager uh, named Herschel Greenspan, uh, he was only 17 years old, he reacted, he was reacting to discriminatory laws that, that were infecting his family he assassinated a, Jew, a German diplomat. And when that happened, the- uh, And this was in France, right? This, this was is- in France. It was, it was taking place, it was, a, it was a Polish Jewish teenager who assassinated a German official in France. And, and we will say it's a fairly low level German official. Very that... low level. Uh, but they turn, the Nazis turned this into this, this huge tragedy of an event. Hitler went to the funeral for this person. And Joseph Goebbels, started to really use this as an opportunity to, to incite violence, to tell you know, German citizens, hey, look what the Jews did. Now we need to retaliate. Uh, and that became the impetus for, for Kristallnacht. So this really in some ways was kind of a major turning point in kind of Nazi policy to this point, at least in my understanding. Prior to this, there'd been all of these kinds of legislative, legal you know, ways in which Jews Jewish rights were limited, but you didn't see violence on mass scales. And then Kristallnacht kind of turns that tide. Correct. This is the first time we see mass violence against, against Jews. And it's perpetrated primarily by uh, members of the SA and Hitler Youth, which is surprising in a lot of ways to, to think about how teenagers and young people played a, played a very pivotal role uh, in the destruction that happens on Kristallnacht. Uh, and they're the ones who really break into the, the storefronts of the Jewish shops, who go into the homes. Uh, but they're not the only ones who are involved in what unfolds on Crystal Knot, uh, because this goes on for two days. Uh, it starts in the evening of November 9th, but it, go, it carries over into the next day, into broad daylight. So it, it becomes a very public event that, that many different people are, 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 are working with. You have this picture here. I do. Um, 
And just as we're looking at it, what are we looking at here? Yeah. What What is this? Yeah. So, uh, you know, I'm asking you, Ellie, what do you see in this picture? <sighs> I see a bunch of people walking. I see bicycles that have been cordoned to the side. Mm -hmm. um, is this a, a deportation? Is this because everyone's men? Uh, it's all men in yeah. the lineup. Exactly. Um, so we talked about the destruction to synagogues and, and property property during Crystal Knot, and over 200 synagogues were destroyed during Crystal Knot, and over 7,000 Jewish uh, businesses were destroyed. Uh, hundreds of people were also killed, um, either during the during Crystal Knot or in the uh, weeks that followed. And the other piece. 30,000 Jewish men were rounded up and taken to concentration camps. It is the first time that, Jew, that, that Jews are rounded up and deported to camps simply because they're Jewish. Mm. So this is a big uh, precursor for what we know is going to happen next. Um, these men are all destined for Dachau, uh, the uh, camp uh, Sashausen, or Buchenwald. Those are the three camps that these men end up in. Some of them are later released uh, and brought, returned to their families. Uh, of course, later on, they'll be rounded up again. Um, but what we're looking, you know, I chose this photo because it's daytime. And as you can see, we have a steady stream of, of, of Jewish men being being paraded uh, to, the, to the transport for concentration camp. And on the left, uh, sort of, you, you pointed out the bicycles, and if you look, you'll see children. There, I see a, a father holding holding a child. I see a little girl uh, sort of facing the front. This is all happening in broad daylight for the public to see. And as you can see, they're not really protesting. No. I mean, you've got these two women overlooking on the uh, embankment up above. Uh, yeah. yeah, no, I think that is, that is well taken and super challenging. Um, I, I think there is this thing where people are like, well, no one knew what was happening. I mean, this is incredibly public. Um, it's incredibly so public. And the uh, the media, the worldwide media also covered this he heavily. I, I think uh, Crystal Knot was on, it was in the, uh, the, it was in the Time Magazine. Like this, this was something that the world saw and, and Germans saw. Um, we actually have a couple of stories, local stories of people who were deported in this roundup. Um, and at, m both of our stories end up with the people being let go and being able to escape. So these are happier endings, but both the Harry Hoffman family and Edie Schaefer's uh, father were um, rounded up and deported in this time. And so it's, you know, one of these things that have very, very... Um, close connections in Milwaukee. And one of our commenters is saying people knew as the windows were smashed, people knew. Um, I want to go to your next picture because I find this is such an interesting story. So hold on one second while I get that queued up. There we go. So tell us about this. this yeah. So this man is named Officer Trock and he uh, resided in Felsberg, Germany. He was an officer on the night of Kristallnacht. Um, so law enforcement was actually ordered by law enforcement and also fire brigades were ordered by the Nazis not to intervene on the night of Crystal Knot. They were only to intervene to save property or people who were not Jewish. Mm -hmm. So if you had a synagogue where that was on fire and it spread to a building nearby that wasn't Jewish, they put that fire out, but they wouldn't put the synagogue fire out. Um, so Officer Trock uh, finds himself wandering the streets on the night of Crystal Knot watching the chaos ensue and he which has to be a little bit of a challenge maybe if you're a kind of in your normal police officing you're, you're in your uniform you don't quite know what to do and it's also you know these are a lot of these are rural communities you know not all of this took place in berlin uh or vienna so it's um i think it's rural it's probably very dark outside you probably uh, know everybody you probably know everybody um and you might not like what they're doing um it's a really challenging situation and he was, again, he was instructed not to intervene, but he came across this mob of SA and, and Hitler youth completely tormenting this Jewish family. Uh, and they were, they were being pushed out of their home. Their home was being destroyed. So Officer Trock actually decided to step in 
and act as a barrier between the, the mob and the Jewish family. And he stayed with that family the rest of the night, uh, protecting them. He did that, you know, against Nazi orders. And, you know, for this reason, you know, we, we look at him at his story very positively. Um, the mob who was surrounding the family shouted at him, get with the times. So he knew these people and they, they were very angry with him uh, for what he did. Uh, but I like to show this story because we talk about how overall people did uh, follow orders and did allow things to happen, but this is a great example of someone who didn't do that. Um, on the flip side, and I, I don't have a photo of this, uh, this person, um, but there's another police officer. His name was Otto Lorenz, and he was a local officer in uh, Frankenburg, Germany, who on the night of Kristallnacht had a Jewish inmate uh, at the local jail. Uh, he had been just monitoring the local jail. That was his job that night. And there was a Jewish inmate there who happened to be a school teacher. And a mob came to the to the uh, prison and wanted the Jewish man handed over. And uh, Officer Lawrence did that. He, he handed this Jewish person over to the mob. And he was very violently beaten, uh, very, very much injured. And then he was sent uh, to a concentration camp and he died in the concentration camp uh, from those injuries. So Officer Lawrence was actually uh, later in 1952, uh, uh, he was given a slap on the wrist and he had to serve time in prison for his role in this man's oh, death. Seen as being complicit in this. Yes. Oh, wow. It is. I think one of the things I take from both of these stories is this, you know, that within all of our us has the, we have the potential to do good or evil. And it's, you know, which of those callings are we really listening to? How are we responding? Even in these terrible and tumultuous times that there are all sorts of different ways of responding. Yeah. And everybody has a role to play, right? Like we talk about how Hitler youth and, and the SAA, yes, they were the ones who primarily smashed the windows, but then every day, citizens walked into those windows and stole property and walked off with it. Uh, so, so everybody has a role to play here and, and citizens chose what roles those were going to be. As we're kind of wrapping up, you every year, uh, her Holocaust Education Resource Center does a commemoration for Kristallnacht. And this year is a little bit of a transitional year. Do you want to kind of describe what's new and different and what people can look forward to? Sure. Yeah. So, you know, we, um, we talked about it even here. We recognize the tremendous power of young people uh, to shape the world they're living in. So we're focusing really heavily this year on uh, responses we've received from students who've worked uh, with, on her, with HERC's uh, educational programming that we offer, our new Holocaust education map. And we'll be showcasing some of the student responses to questions like, what is anti-Semitism? And what do I do to, to fight hate today? And we'll also have an opportunity to, to see uh, pledges made by local interfaith leaders to also help stamp out hate. And it should be a really engaging mini program, very short, airing on Facebook Live next Tuesday, November 9th at 10 a.m. Tuesday, November 9th, 10 a.m., Facebook Live. We'll probably stream it as well. We'll, we'll share it. But feel free to uh, follow on Herc's website. Um, and Facebook page, which uh, is linked in this uh, Facebook as well. Thank you so much, Samantha. It is always great to hear from you. Um, and please keep doing what you're doing. Thank you, Ellie. <laughs> and thank you to our supporter, Robin Cohen, who makes these possible. And if the JMM is open to the public, we hope you'll drop by and visit us. Thanks and have a great day.